Welcome to North Korea, the world's most isolated and repressive state. A country that's always been on the outside, ever since its birth at the end of the Second World War, when Korea was torn in two. The Soviet Union helped to establish a communist state in the North and installed Kim Il-sung as leader. Kim's failed attempt to conquer the South during the Korean War led to a four kilometer wide buffer zone being built between the two nations, the most heavily militarized border on the planet. Today, North Korea remains an anomaly, cut off both politically and geographically from the modern world. But one man is on a mission to change all that, with a basketball. For the first time, this is what happened when Dennis Rodman went to North Korea and staged the most controversial sporting event the world has never seen. To get this story moving, let's rewind to September 2013 and a rather unusual news conference. We're here today for Dennis Rodman to make a historic announcement following his recent visit to North Korea. The Ministry of Sports of the DPR Korea invites Mr. Dennis Rodman and his colleagues to return to DPR Korea to organize a basketball tournament, including the best players from DPRK and a team of 12 former NBA players to be held in January 2014. Dennis Rodman, North Korea and Paddy Parr. Now there's a combination you don't see every day. So just what had brought an ex-NBA star, the world's most vilified country and an Irish gambling company together? Well, it all started a couple of years ago when Dennis's agent received an unexpected phone call. I would say about August of 2012, I was contacted by an executive at Vice Media and said, would Dennis consider being part of a uh, documentary for HBO to go over as their figurehead? Um, it was more of an informal basketball diplomacy type of trip with some Harlem Globetrotters. And uh, they sent me an email picture of Kim Jong-un in I guess it was maybe college shooting some baskets wearing a 91 Rodman Bulls jersey. Actually, the guy in the picture was Kim Jong-un's brother, but let's keep going, shall we? They called him and said, you know, we want you to go to North Korea and, and do a documentary and play the game with the uh, Harlem Globetrotters. And I thought it was a joke. I said, well, whatever. You know, I played with the Harlem Globetrotters you know, a couple of times. Next thing you know, the word got out that, you know, I'm going to North Korea, then all of a sudden, the, all the negativity started to come out about North Korea, how, you know, the country is bad, how they kidnap people, it's crazy, you know, you never come back, and just all these different type of wild, wild animated stories. So I said, it don't really matter to me, I've been worse. <laughs> I looked death in the face too many times in my life, so it doesn't really matter to me. In case you didn't know, from humble beginnings, Dennis Rodman became one of the greatest basketball players the world has ever seen. Now this is where we'd like to show some incredible footage of Dennis's playing career. But unfortunately, the NBA, which owns all of the footage, has flat out refused to take part in this documentary, so we can't. What we can show you is some of Dennis's barmy behavior off the court, which was what really caught the world's attention. His hair, piercings, tattoos, and kooky dress sense made him a press sensation. And then there was his fling with Madonna and his marriage, albeit swift, to Carmen Electra. After hanging up his Nikes, Dennis continued to be the most flamboyant, in-your-face American celebrity around. So you wouldn't have thought that he'd be welcomed in a country that believes in order, conformity, and little freedom of expression. So we went to the game, the game is packed, it's full. I'm sitting on the bench and all of a sudden he walks in. Little short, this little short guy. <laughs> and I'm like, well, wait a minute, who is that? I said, that must be the president of the country. And he walks in with him and his wife and all his, his leaders and stuff like that. So anyway, I walked down there. And that's basically how it all happened. Once the game was over, we got invited, the team got invited to his house, or not his house, his palace, or whatever you want to call it, for dinner. Before I left, me and him were sitting there talking. And I said, you know, I'll be back again. And he said, I would love for you to come back. 
And four months later, Dennis did return, jumping on an army helicopter to the man they called the Marshall's East Coast holiday home. Along for the ride, his personal assistant, Vo. I'll tell you what, I was the only one in the, in the office that, you know, back home that was just really wanted, you know, wanted to go. Other people were not sure and, you know, they've heard, you know, a lot of things through the media and, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm going. <laughs> you know, if Des could go, Des is like my brother, I'm going. I, I want to be there, I want to see what it's all about. You know, I want to see the truth. Everything is just so, like, just five star, six star, seven star. It was just a great day every day. We had so much, it was so much entertainment, so much fun, just so much relaxation. Just everything was just so, so perfect. Last trip he was there, he stood up and did a toast with the whole regime, Kim and his wife there. And he's like, Marshall, your father and your grandfather did some fucked up shit. But you, you're trying to make a change, and I love you for that. And he did a toast, and Dennis and Vo said they thought either they were going to be done right then, or they didn't know what to expect. He said Kim stood up, five-second pause, and he raised the glass and smiled, and they started clapping. And he's like, after that, I knew I can get away with anything. What we really actually talk, 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 I mean, we really, really got really close with each other. And as far as, like, as a friendship bond-wise. While they were kicking back, the marshal opened up about Dennis's previous trip. He, he didn't get the Hall and Girl charge. He didn't get the fact that that's what they do for a living. He didn't, he, didn't like, he didn't like the show. He told me right off the bat, he said, well, he didn't want that. He hated that. Yeah, I figured, he just laughed. I said, yeah, I figured you hated that one. He wanted to see a basketball game. So that's why I think that's what the idea of us coming together saying, you know, I, let's put on the basketball game, a real game. And they surfaced and said, you know, you know his birthday is January 8th, right? So automatically I clicked in quick. I said, we're going to have a game here in, J in January. Why not do it on his birthday? <laughs> on his birthday. So I said, shit, you know, that'd be perfect. He's telling me where he was. He goes, probably, but on a tropical island. It's like his Camp David, but it's, you know, this gorgeous remote island that we were jet skiing and eating and hanging out. And I'm the first non-North Korean to hold his baby. And we got pictures. And guess what? I said, what? The game's happening January 8th. I had tears in my eyes. I couldn't believe it. I said, you got it, son. I was like, you mean no attorney? <laughs> you didn't? He goes, you think you need an attorney with these people? We don't need no attorney. Dennis did need one thing, though, money. Putting on such a big event halfway around the world is going to require a lot of it. But luckily for Dennis, in a moment of pure serendipity, he was about to cross paths with the perfect sponsor. One of the biggest gambling companies in Ireland and the UK, Paddy Power is well known for its headline-grabbing marketing strategies. And it was one of its cheekiest PR stunts yet that led to it first meeting Dennis. It started in a very, very unprecedented circumstance. It was the first papal resignation in the past 600 years. We sent our people out to Rome. We were taking bets on who the next pope would be. Uh, we were also offering a money back special, uh, money back if the next pope is black, because the two favorites uh, were black cardinals, um, Cardinal Lorenzo and Cardinal Turkson from Ghana. So it looked very likely from a betting point of view that the next pope would actually be black. Uh, the two biggest stories on that particular day were Paddy Power taking bets on who the next pope would be, and Dennis Rodman on his first trip out to North Korea. And we thought, there could be an interesting synergy here if we bring the two of them together. And quite literally, 24 hours later, Dennis was on a plane to Rome to help out Rory and Paddy in Vatican City. In Rome, Dennis told Paddy Power about his agreement with Kim Jong-un to put on a basketball game in North Korea. And Paddy Power jumped at the chance to get involved. Paddy Power came out the blue and said, we'll do it. You know, they're, they're one of those type of um, Companies where they just, they love uh, entertainment, they love uh, excitement, they love intriguing things that's going to actually you know, put them on the map. The game's planned for January 8th with the players staying at... That brings us up to the news conference when the game was revealed to the world. Dennis is painting the trip as a way to bridge the gap between North Korea and the United States. Now that might sound like a pipe dream, but it's exactly what happened in the 1970s when a team of US ping pong players travelled to China. The visit eased tensions between the two nations, and two years later, Richard Nixon paid his own visit to the communist state. 40 years on, could Dennis pave the way for the current US government to visit North Korea? It'd be a long shot given the country's rocky relationship, 
Need a quick refresh? Well, as recently as 1994, the United States and North Korea were on the brink of war after falling out over North Korea's nuclear ambitions. But President Bill Clinton, ever the charmer, sent his predecessor Jimmy Carter on a diplomatic mission and Kim Il-sung agreed to put North Korea's nuclear plans on hold. That all changed in the early years of the 21st century when new leader Kim Jong-il put North Korea's nuclear program back in motion after President George Bush took a somewhat different approach to his predecessor by publicly naming North Korea alongside Iran and Iraq in an axis of evil. That brings us to the current administration and President Obama's tactic of strategic patience, which basically means refusing to speak to the third generation and new leader Kim Jong-un until North Korea agrees to disarm. Of course, that means Dennis's willingness to converse with North Korea flies in the face of the USA's current foreign policy. No wonder the White House is keen to distance itself from his efforts. Mr. Rodman is on a private trip, and uh, our views uh, about North Korea and its failure to meet its obligations have not changed. And our views uh, about Kenneth uh, Bai have not changed. Ah yes, Kenneth Bay, an evangelical Christian who was arrested in 2012 while leading a tour group through North Korea. He was later charged with planning to overthrow the government and sentenced to 15 years hard labour. It's yet another cause of friction and Dennis finds himself under pressure as a personal friend of Kim Jong-un's to help push for Bay's release. And then, if that wasn't enough for Dennis to contend with, just one day before he's due to fly out, this happens. Despicable human scum, worse than a dog. That's how North Korean state media described the once powerful uncle. An uncle of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has been executed for trying to overthrow the government. Reports from North Korea tonight say the second most powerful man in the country has been executed. Jang Song Tech, the uncle of the country's leader, had already been stripped of all his powers. Today, a military tribunal ordered his execution after he was found guilty of treason. When the shocking news about Yan Sung Tech breaks, Dennis is enjoying his last night of revelry in his hometown of Miami. The story has turned an even greater spotlight on his trip. Does Dennis really know what he's getting himself into? I'm doing a really, really good basketball game in the world, and no one's ever done this. You know, you got the JCs, the Beyonce, stuff like that. None of these people in the world that's way more famous than I am are doing what I'm doing. I'll get it. <laughs> people to see, you know, I get death threats. I get death threats a lot. Why are you doing this, Dennis? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing this? Is that I'm not doing shit. I'm not doing a goddamn thing. All I'm doing is trying to keep everything together and show people, that, hey, goddamn, man, <laughs> come on. What are you, what am I doing? <laughs> and it's like, whoa, don't you know that he just killed his uncle and sh chopped his head off? I said, no, I didn't know that. What? Don't you know he killed people a lot? No, I didn't know that. Do we in America? Yeah. What? <laughs> Why am I doing it? Why am I trying to change shit? You know, I'm not Martin Luther King. I'm not this bullshit. If someone shoot me, please do it today. Do it fucking today, right now. I'm right here. Fuck it. That's what I tell people. I say, man, I can't sit there and say, hey, you know what? Hey, Marshall, can you let this guy free? Mm. Really? Hey, guy, can you do that for me? Can you do one thing? Uh, can I go over and get him and, and take him back to me, to America and stuff like that? Really? That's not my job. You know, I'm just trying to open the doors as it. And when I says that people do one thing, I would say, someone was knocking at the door. 
Someone's ringing the bell. You know about this. Someone's knocking at the door. Someone's ringing the bell. Do me a favor. Open the door and let us in. Say hi. How you doing? How you doing? Happy, happy holiday. And so the following day, it's a defiant Dennis who sets out for North Korea. Despite the negative media reaction, not everyone is against him. And that includes this man, American Daniel Pinkston, an expert in North Korean politics who turned up at the Paddy Power News Conference. He supports Dennis's trip and believes his presence in North Korea could have a positive effect on the country. I would argue to change policy, first you have to change your mind. You have to have some new thinking. You have to have a different idea to change the policy. So if they are not exposed to any outside information, including media or any kind of news information, books, any type of, of information, and including human people-to-people -people exchanges, whether it's students, basketball players, or anyone else, if we close all of that off, and North Korea is completely uh, sealed shut. How is that going to make it more likely for people to change their minds, to get new ideas, and change the policy? So I, I, I'm kind of puzzled when people have such a strong emotional reaction to this type of, of uh, project. I, I don't see the, the reason or rationale behind it. And, and yes, the regime is repugnant. I don't like the regime, right? But by isolating them, how is it going to increase the likelihood of, of uh, any change? After finally winning the support of someone in an official capacity, Dennis arrives in Beijing, his last stop en route to North Korea, where he meets up with the rest of his entourage. There's his assistant Vo, Rory from Paddy Parr, and another more unlikely travel buddy, a science boffin, Professor Joe, who got involved through a suitably bizarre route. It was a charity auction, and I... Uh, I you know, put down a bid on the chance to meet Dennis after his first trip to Korea, because I was going to be spending the summer in Korea teaching human genetics, and I just wanted to meet him and talk to him, because I thought what he's trying to do with sports is similar to what I was trying to do with science. And, you know, I think science, music, culture, sports are all things that are innocuous where you can build relationships between people. And I told him, you know, if there's anything I could do to help, all you had to do is ask. I get an email from this guy, Joe. Uh, he's a professor, and he goes to North Korea and teaches about American culture. And he's got a friend of his, Michael Spieber, who's, you know, does these tours of North Korea. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And this is like, what are the odds that I'm like, Joe, I was like, we need you right now more than you just. I'm like, I don't know what to trust out there. I'm like, do, you know, can your friend possibly bring him? He goes, oh, absolutely. We'd love to talk to you about that. He goes, and I'll tell you what, he goes, we'll help arrange it as long as we can go and be a part of it. And so this rather curious band of characters sets off on the final leg of its journey, a three-hour hop over the Iron Curtain into North Korea. asked me last night, you know, he goes, so why are you on board? Why are you doing this? And I said, I'm doing this because, first of all, over the many times I've been to Korea, I've grown to just love being here. I like the people. The people are excellent. The food's great. It's just a wonderful place to visit. And I look forward to the chance of trying to help bridge this gap that we have between what Americans think about Korea and what Koreans think about America. And Americans don't have an accurate perception of what things are like here. Understandably so, because they don't get any accurate coverage of what the situation is. They don't know, you know? And um, I try to tell people what I've seen here, my experiences. I've always thought the Korean people are so friendly and warm and inviting. Even if I am a US imperialist bastard, they're still nice to me. <laughs> and always friendly, and they're always warm. You know? Once again, Dennis has arrived on North Korean soil. 
And after settling in his hotel, he's taken straight to an 18-course welcome dinner with the North Korean sports minister. He's told that Kim Jong-un is too busy to attend, which is no surprise seeing as he's just purged his uncle. In the marshal's absence, plans are made for the next few days. It's a relaxed first evening, but tomorrow it's down to business. The next morning, Dennis is up early and ready for action. The January game is just a few weeks away and Dennis is in a race to get everything ready in time. His first stop is the stadium, where the historic matchup will take place. Waiting for Dennis is a select group of North Korea's best basketball players. It's now down to Dennis to pick the very best for the final North Korean team that will face off against the Americans on January 8th. So how good are the North Korean players? Well, better than you might think. Of course, due to the country's isolation, they won't be making waves on the international scene anytime soon. But in quasi-communist states like North Korea, Athletes and national sports teams are important cogs in the state propaganda machine, lauded by the leader to prove what a good job he's doing and to show how powerful a nation he's created. Basketball just happens to be Kim Jong-un's favourite sport too, so a lot of time and money has been put into developing young talent. I tell you, these NBA folk have got their work cut out, I think. Some of them are going to be a little bit podgy and a little bit slow, and these guys are very nimble and quick. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be but, interesting. But the NBA guys are taller. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. So basically what I'm doing, I'm picking 12 of the best players here to play against the NBA All-Stars. Disappointing because I didn't pick them just because they're there, you know. It's gonna be an awesome feeling, man, because you guys never played before the professional athletes, and these guys are very good. When I'm bringing over, they're very good. Over the next few days, Dennis is kept busy whipping the North Korean team into shape, sharing all the know how he built up over a decade at the top of the game. Sure, they might not be good enough to make it in the NBA, but boy, can they shoot! Thank you. With the training complete, Dennis has seen firsthand how North Korea's investment in basketball is starting to bear fruit. The North Korean officials are keen to show him more of the same, and before he can catch his breath, he's taken on a specially organized sports tour of Pyongyang. Just like 
Dennis and his entourage are taxied around the capital from one side to another. Following him wherever he goes is a camera crew from the state-run television station. It's a big scoop having such a high-profile celebrity in the country, and they fully intend to make the most of the opportunity. And the North Korean officials can't resist slipping in a visit to a war museum full of captured American aircraft. Luckily, that doesn't overly dampen the group's spirits. It was, uh, it was surreal. It was extraordinary. It was, um, you know, the cold was, uh, you know, the first thing you notice, minus 10, minus 12, clear blue skies, very beautiful. Um, but it was, I think it's the nearest thing you can, can liken it to is a, a, a real live Truman show. You know you're being watched the whole moment. It's very produced, you can't, you know, move around on your own autonomy, you can't leave the hotel without your minders. Um, but, you know, uh, you're told what you can film, you know, you're to told who you can speak to. But the people were lovely, um, they treated us very well. What Dennis probably doesn't suspect is that he's been used for a spot of propaganda to counter the image of Pyongyang as a dour, depressed place and to show off the best of it to everyone back home. Our man Daniel Pinkston has his own views on that. I've been, I've been to North Korea um, five times. The political promotion of propaganda, and uh, that's true and that's real, but there's also just a human side to that as well, right? Someone, their hometown is Paris, and someone comes from, they come from Vietnam, and they come to Paris, they're gonna show them the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower, they're gonna show them nice things. And I say, and I say well, let me go find the worst place in Paris. You know, anybody's gonna do that, so there's, Yes, that they want. There is the, the, the element that they want to, to uh, manipulate for for the propaganda value. Yes, that's true. But there's also a big part of it. It's just it's just human nature. The last stop on the tour is a new sports complex where Dennis is asked to shoot a few baskets for the cameras. Dennis was a rebounder, not a shooter. But even so, he might need to dust off a few cobwebs before the big game. I can't shoot. I can't shoot. Give me a ball. I can't shoot. <laughs> it was like. I'm tired. I can't, I don't know what the fuck, I can't even shoot at that ball. <laughs> Shit. Oh my God. Oh, come on. Uh, Finally. <laughs> It's just a few days until Christmas, and it's time for Dennis and his entourage to head home to spend some quality time with their friends and families. As a nation, North Korea doesn't follow any traditional sort of religion, and they certainly don't celebrate Christmas. But was Dennis disappointed that his friend, Kim Jong-un, hadn't gotten into the spirit and stopped by for a visit? I'm not just coming over here to meet the leader, uh, uh, the marshal. I came over here to... Um, to uh, meet the basketball team, to uh, prepare a great game for the leader for his birthday. And people need to understand that um, it was, it's not important for me to, to meet him every time I come over because he has a, another greater job to do for his country. <laughs> so Dennis remains upbeat, and with the first part of the trip successfully under his belt, he arrives back in Beijing. But what Dennis doesn't know is that while he's been away, International interest in the game has erupted, and the world's media is waiting for him.
Christmas break, the amount of negative press surrounding the game mounts and mounts. Dennis the focal point of the media's anger. And Dennis learns that as a result, not everybody will be joining him on the return journey to Pyongyang in a fortnight's time. Everything changed before Christmas. Our collective view in terms of our participation in the project changed before Christmas. Um, and that had obviously to do with the purge. Uh, North Korea was suddenly the subject of, of intense, intense international scrutiny. Dramatic statement that Kim Jong-un intends to be ruthless. Fears of a new instability in North Korea. Kim Jong-un is basically telling the elite in Pyongyang if you're disloyal to me, you will be executed. That made us reassess exactly what we were doing. And that led us to a position that we were no longer comfortable being associated with the event. Paddy Power has pulled out, which at first glance would seem to be a massive blow for Dennis. Without them, his project would never have gotten off the ground. And it would have been fun to watch a self-promoting gambling company hanging out in a country where both advertising and gambling are illegal. But when Dennis arrives back in Beijing, he doesn't seem too concerned. Now, Paddy Power are not around. This is solely the Dennis Rodman show. No wonder he seems upbeat as he meets his fellow American basketball players who've signed up for the match. Cliff Robinson. Uh, I played 18 years in the NBA. Um, this is an opportunity of a lifetime for me. Uh, Doug Christie played the NBA for 14 years uh, from Los Angeles via Seattle, Washington. <laughs> nah, Kenny Anderson played 14 years in the NBA. Uh, coach high school ball now in Florida. The number one dunker in the world. <laughs> 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 uh, my name is uh, Guy Dupree. Um, I'm from Paris, France, living in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, 26 years old. Playing a year league. Ben Baker played 13 years in the NBA. Um, currently um, finishing halfway through my master's program at, at Union Seminary in New York. Name Andre Poole, also known as uh, Silk, you know, to the streetball world. My name Antoine Scott from North Carolina. Uh, graduated from Wake Forest. One key member of the squad is the former New York Knicks power forward Charles Smith. Since leaving the NBA, he's carved out a career staging exhibition games around the world. We're the first U.S. team to step on North Korea's soil and have a game against their national team. That's a fact. We, from this point on, we are going to, everybody in this room is going to be bonded for the rest of our lives in a historical, epic event. You know, anyway, guys, you know what? It's amazing, guys. Thank you guys for doing this. You know, like I said, it's not for me. It's for, like, uh, this is basically, uh, a game pretty much for the world. And the one thing I'm very fortunate, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I'm actually have an opportunity to be in that country and the marshal actually likes me. And I'm not trying to be a politician. I'm not trying to be this this, you know, this world leader, try to, you know, rescue people, stuff like that. This is all about sports. This is all about sports. There's ain't nothing nothing else besides that. And when the media asks you guys anything, because it's coming. When you go to the airport, you don't see it. This is gonna be a fucking motherfucker. So I'm saying, when they ask you questions, just keep it, just keep it bland as hell. You know, we're just going to play a game. Play a game, it's all about sports. Keep it natural and cool. They need something. They're like vultures. They gotta have something. And they're coming to get something. And our job is not to give them anything. I gotta get out of this place.
So Dennis's pals are here, and for his fourth time, he's on a flight to Pyongyang. On the surface, it seems like everything is back on track, apart from one very significant thing. Despite Dennis appearing to be in good spirits, the Christmas break was a really stressful time. He got a hammering in the press and he was hounded wherever he went, which led to a number of painful family issues. To cope with the added stress, Dennis has started drinking. A lot. He's battled alcoholism for much of his adult life, and with the game just a couple of days away, it's not the best of times to be falling off the wagon. <laughs> American team makes a short stop off at the Corio Hotel. So what are the first thoughts? Wow. Excited for the next two days. We'll go to a nice dinner tonight, and we're really enjoying it so far, having a great time. It's, I guess it's a culture shock in a lot of ways. This is something that we haven't experienced. I mean, I haven't personally. I've been to a few countries, uh, but this, this one is different. So tonight will be an interesting experience to see dinner. Uh, obviously, uh, Dennis <laughs> will be entertaining. <laughs> As Doug mentions, they're off to a fancy gala dinner that's been held in the player's honor. In attendance, a number of important dignitaries and personal friends of Kim Jong-un. Hey guys. Hey guys. Really? All the shit? Oh, shit. Dennis, who has continued drinking since the flight, gets things off to an interesting start by holding the sports minister's hand as they walk into the room. I would like to express my thanks to Mr. Dennis Rodman for his several visits to our country. The respected Marshal Kim Jong Un has paid a deep attention to the visit of Mr. Rodman and his group at the House of Commons. After a warm welcome from the North Koreans, it's now time for Dennis as the guest of honor to deliver his own momentous speech. In the Navy. So sorry. Anyway, um, I want to thank all my guys here from America, former NBA players, for coming here. It's very, uh, it's an honor to do what we're doing. Oh, here we go again with the toast thing. God damn it. You got a toast, guys. Gotta get a toast. It's every two minutes. I told you, it's every two minutes. Uh, Jesus Christ. Hey, Ben Baker, you want to talk? Um, this is a tremendous opportunity for us as former NBA players to bring basketball here to your country. And we really appreciate the opportunity. And we hope that this is something special that will last a lifetime for you and your families as well. So whatever we've heard about North Korea is in the past. We are here uh, for our eyes to see. We are here because we wanted to be here. We are here at your invitation. And we are looking very forward to playing the match against the 
North Korea senior team, and I think it's going to be a great entertainment. 
Oh, the fuck hook me. But the show must go on. Watch this. Up the sky. For all his enthusiasm, Dennis isn't in the ideal condition to lead the drills. Come on, guys, come on, hit him! Come on, guys! Yeah! Charles Smith, who runs basketball courses all over the world, is quick to step in and take charge. Before you catch the ball, tell him to read the defense. He's got to know where the defender is. Not like this. You want to jump. Good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Hey, hey, hey. Good job. Good job. You ready? Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Play, play, play. Come on. Go, 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 go. Come on. Play. No, we're not playing, Dennis. We're trying to show him what to do. We're trying to show him what to do. He don't know what to do. All right. All right. I don't shit. I'm trying. Hey, just play it. Come on. Boom. Oh! Look at the side. Dude. Oh! Half court. Oh! Uh, uh, uh. It's sad to see Dennis playing such a minor role. After all, he picked this North Korean team just a few weeks ago. They're a talented bunch, and it's possible that Charles and the other US players are underestimating them. Something Dennis might have been able to tell them, but right now he's a bit too drunk to be much use to anybody. Dennis is unpredictable, especially when he had a few. Uh... But at the end of the day, like I said, Dennis is a, 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 a great guy in my mind, uh, a guy who has a big heart and only wants to try to do the best. So what do you think about the, uh, the he don't understand what the fuck I'm saying. Well, switch, switch. <laughs> switch. As the session winds down, what do the North Koreans think about the upcoming game? The match uh, to be held tomorrow will be a good opportunity to exchange and to learn each other in the field of basketball. We think it is most important thing uh, to learn each other and to exchange the experience. It is a good opportunity for us to exchange and to learn each other. It almost seems as though they've been told what to say, but not everybody is towing the line. <laughs> So thank you. The US players head back to the hotel for a spot of relaxation, but some worrying news awaits them. A number of players have been left messages by their sponsors back in the United States, who are threatening to drop them if they take part in the game. Understandably, the camp becomes unsettled, and suddenly there's talk of pulling out, just a day before the game. Again, Charles Smith takes charge, and crisis talks are held behind closed doors. Okay. When the players re-emerge, it's revealed that Smith has organised an exclusive interview with the news network CNN. The players hope it'll give them a chance to tell their side of the story and calm the situation with their sponsors back home. Smith gets busy working through a list of CNN's questions to make sure the players all sing from the same hymn sheet. The professional basketball alumni. In the letter, got to mention the Olympic. Right. Because that, that was part of the right. assurance. Right. Uh, Dennis, on the other hand, who's been relaxing with a few more drinks in his room, has only just found out what's going on. Um, come on! We expect it to be a capacity crowd because it's been a capacity crowd everywhere we go. Okay. That, that's the answer. We're just going over the questions. Going over all the questions. Dennis, we're just going over all the questions today. 
Yeah. We're on the same page. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. getting on the same page. We're oh. almost there. Okay, fuck it. Right. Floyd. Are you staying with us or are you going? Yeah, let's finish this. Let's finish this so that we can Dennis doesn't stick around to go through the questions. Instead, he waits outside, frustrated and maybe just a little bit jealous of Charles Smith's growing influence. Yeah, the players are going to say their piece to everything. And then, and the, he threw a glass. And then outside of, outside of the... He might be in a strop, but Dennis is still the face of the trip, and Charles knows they need to keep him on side. When we finish, we all get with him, say thank you, you gotta make him feel good. I got you. Me of all people is trying to change something around the world. Yep. And the one thing I like to do is like help people. And finally it's paying off after all these trying years. Okay, there should be somebody called Chris coming to talk to you soon on that IFB in your ear, and you'll have one in your ear in a moment. Darren, I'll put this on this Darren. side. Darren. Try and tuck this. We're live here. Doug. Uh, are you in this? We received a letter from the DPRK Olympic Committee on an invitation to do this game. Um, this isn't about Dennis Hill. We're here specifically to put smiles on people's faces, everlasting memories in the minds of, of, of individuals, and hopefully with the good work that we do, we give to charity while we're here. So please don't continue to put politics into that. This is not what we're here for. I get okay, it, Charles. I, mean, I get it. I can get I why you're that? there. It's the <laughs> problem is it's more complicated than basketball. It just is. It's more complicated than basketball, but you fellas. Know what? I'm sorry. You say you know, you say it's more complicated than, than basketball. Basketball is not complicated to us, and that's what we do. The game has been present, presented as a birthday present to the rule, ruler. I'm not here to fight with you guys. I respect what you're doing. I'm just concerned right. for the family of this right. man who is held there, and I am concerned, as many Americans are, about giving a birthday present to a man who is seen as a despot who just had his uh, uncle uh, executed. Uh, Dennis, you understand uh, the issue. It's not about hating you know, you on American continue, basketball players. Yeah, but you can, you can, we're not, again, we're not here to deal with the, the politics. The, the date of the game is the date of the game. The interview is nearly over, and Charles has skillfully navigated every question on CNN's list. But at the last moment, the interviewer lobs a potentially dangerous, unscripted question into the mix. Dennis, let me end on this. You do have a relationship with this man. Yes. Are you going to take an opportunity, right, right. if you get it, right. to speak up for the family of Kenneth Bay? Will you take the opportunity? I know, well, 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 if you understand what Kenneth Bay did, do you understand what he did? What did he do? You in tell this me. Country. Will you tell me what did he do? And, and uh, no, 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 no. You tell me. You tell me. Why is he held captive? They haven't released any country. charges. They haven't Why? released. They haven't released any reasons. I, 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 I got no let me, let me do this. I would love to speak on this. Go ahead. You know, you got, you got, you got, you got ten guys here. Ten guys here. They have left their families. Left their damn families to help this country as in a sports venture. Got 10 guys, all these guys here. Do anyone understand that? We do, and we appreciate that, and we wish them yeah, well with cultural right. exchange. No, 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 I'm just saying, no, I don't give a shit what the, I don't give a rat's ass what the hell you think. I'm saying to you, look at these guys here. Look at them! Yeah, but Dennis, don't Listen, put it they, on them. They don't use them as an excuse they for the behavior out. that you're they that you're away. putting on yourself. They came here. They came here. You just basically were saying that Kenneth but, Bay did something listen, wrong. You, we don't you, even you, know what can, the charges are. But, don't listen, use these guys listen, as a shield for you, you Dennis. Can, you, listen, uh, listen, 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 oh, listen. You know, still, I got, I got it. Let me, let me do this. Really, really. I'm gonna tell you one thing. People around the world, around the world, I'm gonna do one thing. You guy behind the mic right now, we are the guys here doing one thing. We have to go back to America and take the abuse. Do you have to take the abuse? What we gonna take? Do you, sir? Let me know. Are you gonna take the abuse? We gonna get. But guess what, Joe? 
one day, one day, this door is going to open because these 10 guys here, all of us, I mean, everybody here, and we could just open the door just a little bit. The key is you can bait uh, Dennis or any of us no, Charles, into Charles, that's a not my intention. And that's not my emotional. intention. But that's not. Charles, but, but it's but not my intention. It really is. That's what it really is. But let me finish. Please. We're not here to talk politics. So outside of that, any questions that come back through that is baiting to get us into politics. Charles, and that's not what we're here for. Charles, Every man sitting here understands that. Charles, I understand it as well. I wish you good luck with the cultural exchange, but you know the issues that are at play. Good luck with the game. I hope it has the results that you want it to, and I wish you a safe trip home. Thank you for joining us this morning. Yeah. By getting lured into a discussion about Kennet Bay, Dennis may have sabotaged Charles' attempt to paint the trip as a cultural sporting exchange. Worried about the effect the outburst might have on their public image back home, the players hold yet more crisis talks. But that's not, we gotta really toe the line. Stay on the same page every step oh, of the way. And, and Dennis, listen, it's not about that. It's I'm about that. Don't give it's, a it's shit about, about it, it's Charles. About, but listen. This ain't the fucking listen, NBA, you see this whole game, really? No, 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 no. This, you're missing the point. I, I'm missing the point, why the fuck are you here? That's not, we got that, we're past that. We're at a juncture right now. We're at a certain juncture, the certain crossroad that we have to get to. this guy? Really, Charles? Really? You're the same yeah. fucking dickhead guy? I'm gonna yeah. rest yeah. ass. I'm, gonna, I'm so yeah. sorry. No, no, watch this. No, ain't about me drinking or nothing like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm gonna talk about myself. one thing uh, how we address the media moving forward. That's it. We? We want you to agree to stay away from answering or getting down the road with political questions. But, That's it. Charles, guess what? Am I right, guys? Okay. Am I right? Uh, That's it. That's it. It's okay, so, so, That's it. Charles, have you ever heard me? You just did. No, no, no. Stay away from politics and stick to what we're doing, which is playing basketball. Yeah. From this point on, you all in agreement? Yeah. All right, Oscar. Yang, yang. <laughs> Despite Charles and Dennis's show of unity, the players are still concerned about what the reaction to the interview will be. And the question still stands, are they going to play or pull out? That's why he brought it up. Did he, did he bring it up? He brought, brought us up, what was that? The sports minister about whether or not we should still go through with it. Their translator came up to me. Like, is there is there an issue? And I was just like, no, you know, I said, look, you know, they, you know, they, they're hearing it, obviously, back home. I don't have a feeling on it because I'm dealing with 12, 13 other guys. So my opinion only matters after we get a general consensus by committee. Well, it's not anything to work out. It's just to find out how guys feel. We got to see, you know, how guys are feeling, what's going on. It's, it's very important. I mean. You know, our, our country is our country. Yes. So, A couple of hours later, with the game still hanging in the balance, Doug and Charles manage to get access to the hotel's closely guarded internet service, and they find the interview online. What would they think now that the dust had settled? Hmm. This has a, it has a different context yeah. when you see it, Charles. Yeah, it does. It wasn't bad. It wasn't. Other than the Kenneth Bay thing, his emotion at the very beginning and what he said after that was, was spot on. It was. It was good. Because it came across. That, he fe that he's feeling hurt about yeah. what's going on. Right. Yeah, but sitting up there, it didn't. I, man, I wish Vin and them would have came. Because they was feeling what we were feeling to see it. Thanks, guys. After this, I hope they're not ostracizing us as much as they were prior right. to that. Right, yeah. It's a possibility. Yeah. You know that. But that was overall, I can give it a B. Yeah. Which is a B. I was like a D. A D minus <laughs> I was, I was like, oh, like, oh, we're oh, in trouble. Shit. It doesn't look like how it felt sitting oh, okay. there. <laughs> no, they showed the whole entire thing. Oh. But the thing with Dennis, and there's some we were all sitting there. Yeah. So we got caught up yeah. in him. 
So, mm -hmm. But when you look at the thing and how they pan it and shot it, the only thing he did is go back and forth with Bay, but his other stuff it was actually very good. Word spreads to the other players. They get together for more discussion, and at the 11th hour, they finally decide to stay and prepare for match day. The game is on. As the players make their way to the court, there's a buzz of activity in the corridors, and there's only one explanation. The marshal, Kim Jong-un, has arrived. Standing in the tunnel and listening to the roar of the crowd, the scale of the event only just starts to hit home. For the first time ever, an American team will play an away fixture in North Korea, with Kim Jong-un watching on. National pride is at stake, and even though the event will only be broadcast in North Korea, the result will be eagerly anticipated around the world, so it's a game neither side will want to lose. With the players out on court and 20,000 North Koreans waiting patiently, it's time for Dennis's big moment. here from the U.S. having the, uh, the guts to believe in me, to be here with the marshal for his birthday. A lot of people have um, expressed um, different views about me and your leader here, the marshal. And I, I, I take that as a, a compliment, a compliment as far as the world. Yes, he's a great leader. He provides for his, for his people here in this country. And thank God, the people here love the marshal. Um, 
For the people in North Korea, I want to say one thing. This is history breaking grounds for everyone that's involved. My peers here, the national team here, all I want to say is this to my, my friend and his wife and his family, his family. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Marshall. Happy birthday to you. Dennis's serenading of the Marshall is very unexpected, even by his standards, and shows how naive he is to the wider political situation. It's very unlikely to go down well back home, but for now that'll have to wait. There's a basketball game to be played. And in another unexpected move, Dennis has decided to split the game into two halves. In the first half, it's the main event, the United States against North Korea. In the second half, Dennis is mixing up the teams, so both North Koreans and Americans will play side by side. A nice touch that will hopefully underline the real importance of the trip, bringing the people of two nations, divided in so many ways, closer together. But first, can the ex-NBA players beat a team of eager, hungry, young North Koreans, keen to please their marshal? Speaking to the US coach, he seems more worried about his own team's fitness levels than those of the opposition. Uh, just do a lot of rotations, get everyone in the game early so they get a feel for the court and the surroundings, uh, just so they can get comfortable out there. So uh, we'll do a lot of substituting. If guys are, uh, are really tired, we'll get them out early and get them back in sooner. US players start by trying to use their height advantage, but their handling lets them down. The North Koreans' response is to use their own advantage, speed. They move the ball fast, staying out of reach and shooting from outside the three-point arc. The Americans register their first points. The cool head and hands of Doug Christie and a bank shot from Vin Baker. They're back in the game, which is more physical than they'd expected. Korea continue to dominate, playing a pass and move style of basketball which catches the Americans flat-footed and defending too deep to prevent a succession of three-point shots. Rattled, the visitors call a timeout to take stock and catch their breath. Charles Smith and the rest of the team are starting to realize what Dennis knew all along. These guys can shoot. up the tempo again, their decision-making and hand speed too much for an aging team, including an out-of-condition Dennis.
At the end of the first period, with the Americans trailing by 10 points, Dennis bows out to enjoy watching the rest of the game with his friend Kim Jong-un. The second quarter brings more of the same. team does rally, but fatigue starts to play its part, and for all their effort, nothing quite comes off. At the end of the second quarter, the score is USA 39, North Korea 45. A win for the DPRK and an indication that just maybe the professionals have underestimated their opponents. Uh, we trained them, we taught them to beat us. The competition was good. They played extremely hard, physical, very physical. Which is extremely hard. Which is, which is really good. Which is good. Yeah, no doubt. They beat us in two quarters. You know, we, we had two more quarters to go, but we split time. We was down by like nine points. <laughs> but um, they could play a little bit. I didn't. I think I took you know took it for granted that you know playing the guys these guys are not that good, but they can shoot. They in great shape. They run the floor well. Uh, you know, I have to give those guys credit because they they played extremely hard. Uh, they were. Uh, very focused, and they knew what to do to uh, uh, be effective against us. It's interesting because they had a strategy um, to play against us. Um, you know, older NBA players, and they used that European driving kick, shorter, faster guys. So the game was much more competitive and much more interesting than I thought it would be. As Dennis planned, the teams change up for the second half. And it just happens that with the two nationalities mixed together, the crowd sees some of the best action of the night. With Dennis and Kim Jong-un watching on. Still a strange sight. The leader of the world's most controlled state and America's most out of control celebrity laughing and joking like a couple of old college buddies. <laughs> As the game reaches a close, it's hard to say what long-term effect it may or may not have. But the interaction between the North Korean and US players feels like an unerringly positive thing. 
with millions of North Koreans watching their kin standing shoulder to shoulder with the old enemy on their TV screens. After the game, the marshal meets his players. As we know, he's a big basketball fan after all. In the dressing room, there's a sense of euphoria and relief that the game actually took place. But for Charles, it's all too much. I just needed a, a moment to myself to uh, kind of reflect and get the emotion out because it's been pent up through the whole trip. It's always difficult working with Dennis, but it, it, it usually works out well. I, I should start having birthdays in the fucking <laughs> In less than 24 hours, we were actually thinking of not playing this game. We were actually thinking of not playing. The high emotions are felt in the North Korean camp too. It's a great, great, great pleasure and the happiness and honor for him. With their achievements starting to sink in, the players begin to celebrate. Bring it in, guys. Bring it in. Come on. I'm feeling, I'm feeling some love. Bring it in. Bring it in. Come on. Bring it in. Feeling some love. We did it. 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 We for the first time since they stepped foot in Pyongyang, everyone gets to let their hair down. And yep, Joe gets another chance to show off his well-honed karaoke skills. <laughs> After everything that's happened over the last few days, there's a good show of togetherness, and the revelry lasts well into the night. Who would have thought it? And I love North Korea. The next day, the US players, with a few sore heads, head out for some specially organized R&R time with the North Korean team. We had a chance to actually interact with the um, national team. So we went to the water park, got on slides together, the guys just pulled me over, come, come. Even though it was a different language barrier, we communicated with each other. It was good to be around those guys away from the gym in a different atmosphere, and it was the same thing. It was all love. I mean, we had a great time with those guys. And it's going to be a, a bond. It's going to probably be, you know, from that day forth all the way throughout. You know, um, a lot of the players that were there, you know, of course, remembered all the guys from, you know, from the game and stuff like that. And, you know, we just went there to have a good time, kind of, you know, unwind a little bit. You know, it's a couple guys we got in the sauna. You know, we did the little water slide stuff, got in the pools and stuff. They showed us a lot of love, a lot of respect, and we did the same, you know, with them. Meanwhile, Dennis and a small number of his group are whisked away on a separate trip. 
While they were chatting during the game, the marshal told Dennis that he'd made plans for them to spend the weekend together at Masik, the country's new luxury ski lodge, three hours east of the capital. By the time Dennis arrives, some of the marshal's family and entourage are already on the slopes. First, he's invited to a thank you meal with the sports minister before being taken on an exclusive tour of the resort. After the officials have shown the place off to the cameras, Dennis's film crew is informed that only Dennis and the closest members of his group will be allowed to stay to meet Kim Jong-un. It's a shame, as there'd been the possibility of securing a world-exclusive interview with the marshal, but it's not to be. And so grudgingly, the crew leave Dennis, Vo, Joe and Michael to enjoy the slopes while they trek back to Pyongyang. The next morning, it's time for the American players to say their goodbyes and head back to the United States. Now that the game is over, what were their thoughts on the trip? There was so much media uh, scrutiny uh, on the players individually, which we didn't expect. We knew that there were going to be some negative publicity surrounding the, uh, uh, the game and us being in, in Korea, North Korea, but we didn't expect our country to bash us personally. That caught us off guard, and that was pretty frustrating. And some of the guys uh, had some personal issues with it, their families and uh, their children, and it was, it was kind of tough. I don't know if I'm, I'm worried about the backlash. I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating both, you know, family and friends happy that I'm home, and then there'll be some people who don't understand and be puzzled by the fact of, that we went. I don't, I don't, I don't know. How much, how much shit I'm gonna get into when I go back home, which I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. I have to just, you know, face the consequences because I did something out of radical nature, you know, and uh, that's, that's cool, that's cool with me. I just have to deal with it, but I'm not sad. I'm, I'm like, yo, I did something that, you know, people in America didn't agree with fully and I have to deal with it. Um, I certainly didn't intend for this to be a birthday celebration for anyone. Um, and that's what it turned into be. So it was unfortunate that um, we were all, you know, in that situation. But we have to move on from it. I didn't even know going over there that it was a birthday or that it was going to be looked at as a, as a birthday gift. I don't regret it one bit. It doesn't matter what scrutiny I get at home, what people say at home, they're not me. They're not in my head. They, they don't know what I go through on a daily basis. They don't live in my shoes. So I felt it was a good opportunity, as well, I think, as everyone else that's here to show the world that this place that they call North Korea is not as bad as what they think. I'm just telling them I had a great time. Um, it's by far, as a professional, um, I would say it's probably my, my best experience basketball-wise as a pro. Like anything, anything, just anything. You know, you look at even from the standpoint of Dennis to be, you know, uh, even in the presence of this guy. You say they're friends. They say, yeah, you like, say that that's, he's my friend. you know, like, there's no one right now in the United States that can say that. Right. Nobody. Like, right. there's nobody that can say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's my man. That's, you know, we cool. <laughs> right. Nobody.
A few days later, it's Dennis's turn to head home after spending a full weekend with the marshal. Beijing airport is buzzing as the world's press waits to find out what happened at the ski lodge. But when Dennis appears, he's swept through the airport and onto his connecting flight without saying a word. And on the plane home, the truth comes out. Despite being promised that they'd spend some quality time together, the marshal never showed. It's desperately disappointing news for Dennis, especially after everything he'd gone through to get the game to happen. So why did Kim Jong-un choose to leave his good friend high and dry? Now that the game was over, had the marshal simply gotten everything he needed to out of Dennis? Could it be that this was all just a cleverly devised propaganda campaign by Kim Jong-un to show his people just how powerful he is, inviting a group of Americans to Pyongyang and beating them at their own game? According to Daniel Pinkston, this doesn't really stack up. I just don't buy that argument because um, the state narrative and the propaganda narrative is compliance and conformity, obey, obedience. And here is Dennis Rodman, who is one of the most um, unusual nonconformists we could think of. And here he is in the embrace of Kim Jong-un. And it's sending this message that, hey, it's OK to be different. They never saw an American before. And they go back and they think, well, everything I read in textbooks and everything my school teacher told me in school and everything the party cell member told me and everything our coach told us and everything that the state media told me was that Americans are evil, uh, they're trying to kill us. But the Americans I saw, they were friendly, they're like us. This is a very subversive message. And people remember that. Those uh, young people have those interactions with the Americans. They will never forget it as long as they live. And people underestimate that. So why didn't the marshal show? It turns out that up at the ski lodge, Dennis went on the mother of all drinking binges and his behaviour got increasingly out of control. With the marshal's friends and family watching on, the decision was made for Kim to save face and to give Dennis a wide berth. In other words, Dennis blew it. The game was a great showpiece, no doubt, but this was his chance to build on their relationship. Their friendship, as odd as it may seem, had a lot of potential. In the long run, it really could have led to improved relations between the United States of America and North Korea. And who knows, it might even have persuaded President Barack Obama to engage with North Korea. But Dennis's alcoholism and sheer unpredictability got the better of him. And his dream of opening the door to North Korea may have gone up in smoke for good. As soon as Dennis arrived back in America, he booked himself straight into rehab, in his own words, to cool off. Three weeks later, he left the clinic. Now that he'd sobered up and has had time to reflect on the trip, what did he feel about the marshal's no-show? Well, it was a little different. It was different. There was something, whatever. They didn't want to bring around me because I was too doing my thing. So <laughs> that's why. But I was doing, I was, you know, drinking. I was so drunk, you know, because I'm pretty sure he's like, oh, OK, you know, you got to keep his image up. OK, great. I understood that. That was cool. That was cool how you did that. I had to drink to fucking get myself together. <laughs> you know, it, it, it went to that far for me. I had to drink a little bit more than I usually drink because I just didn't want to hear the bullshit, you know. But uh, like I say, I survived it. Life goes on, and guess what? It's a happy day. Dennis brushes over it, but is he being completely honest with himself? He cherished his relationship with Kim and knew that this was his chance to show the world what he could do. Dennis also appeared to have a real affinity with North Korea. At the start of this journey, it seemed that the DPRK and Dennis Rodman couldn't be any more different. But as Joe explains, they're more alike than you might think. People accuse Dennis Rodman of being crazy, being stupid, and I'll tell you, he's neither. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Once I got to know him, I didn't expect that before I met him, because we all know that he has trouble sometimes being articulate. But he says that when, when you see him work, it's just like he was on the field when he's playing basketball on the court. He can predict what's going to happen in the future, and he sees things in multiple dimensions. So he's a very smart, actually smart guy. North Korea is accused of the same damn thing. North Korea people say they're irrational because they don't take the time to understand their premises and to understand how they think. But most of the things they do are completely logical once you understand that their value system and their premises are different. So it's the same for Dennis and North Korea, and it's a common bind that unites them, is that neither 
is either stupid or crazy. They just are accused of that by the mainstream and the mainstream opinion and the media. And so I think that they bond over that. Not only is he not stupid, Dennis Rodman somehow became the one high-profile American with direct contact to the ruling power in North Korea. Whether that relationship has gone for good, we'll have to wait and see. Dennis has to take responsibility for his own actions. But if the establishment hadn't been so tough on him, then maybe, just maybe, he wouldn't have hit the self-destruct button quite so hard. I mean, the more you keep going at it, the more you keep going at it, the more you keep pursuing something, pursuing something, sooner or later, something's got to happen. It's a big picture, not this one. It's a big picture, OK? So, you know, it's like, it's going to work. And people are going to open their eyes and say, wow, OK, great, cool. We, we could actually go over to North Korea and actually survive and actually come back and actually say, wow, you know, it's not so bad. But uh, people want to make it like that country is so, it's like the devil, and it's not. Oh, 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 oh,